so yeah, my name is uh, Lalu or uh, Rosby. You can me on the internet, and that's the email that you can meet me at. Uh, that's kind of a new one. But yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of like black clients in general, and then uh, the current theory of black clients, and then also what we're working on in terms of black clients, and then also how that factors into Lightning Network itself. And uh, you know, the talk is called Neutrino because that's the name of our new Lightning client. I mean, the new Lightning client that we're, that we're coming that uh, has already released, and there's been kind of a big proposal, and I'll go over all of that uh, talk itself. All right, so you know, kind of like a high level. Uh, this is what I call like the usefulness meter for a Bitcoin client, essentially. So all the way on the left you have that's totally useless. All the way on the right you have you know it's useful, it can actually like serve the network, and uh, you know is actually uh, contributing to other peers. So on the left we have like eavesdroppers. This is like chain analysis. You know those people that basically connect to you have like 50 amount connections, they do mempool commands, and try to like you know intersect all your all your uh, transactions. Then we have pseudo nodes. So these are nodes that basically pretend to be nodes, and you know, they actually advertise all the parallel network bits, but they basically just proxy all the Request of other nodes they're connected to, right? So it looks like they're a node, but they're not really a node, they're a pseudo node. And then there are light clients, which are kind of, uh, you know, actually more like nodes that actually do some verification and can provide useful services. Then there's kind of SPV, which are light clients, but a little bit more resilient, meaning that, um, you know, they'll be able to actually verify, like, um, incorrect behavior by miners, by other nodes. Then we have pre nodes, like full nodes, but they, they don't have the entire blockchain. And so they're not as useful as full nodes because, you know, they can't serve this or pertain to other peers. But they can, you know, serve from tip possibly and help relate transactions and also provide connection slots. And then we have full nodes, which are the most useful. So uh, this is kind of the scale that is currently. And I'm going to be focusing on kind of light clients and then maybe some of the, uh, the you know, um, uh, border between light clients and regular SVB nodes. All right, so what is a light client, right? So, you know, uh, I guess this is kind of like my definition. So light clients, by definition, don't really verify the entire chain. Uh, if they did, then they wouldn't be light because the chain is kind of heavy, part of like, you know, 150 gigabytes plus with all the indexes and such. Um, so, but what they are able to verify is they can verify the block headers, right? They can verify connectivity of the block headers, and then also that each header um, you know, follows rules with respect to difficulty adjustments, and um, actually has a valid, valid PAL, and they can check some other um, factors like the timestamp and other consensus rules around that. So, you know, my clients themselves, they employ chain weighting, so basically, you know, they get all the headers, they can count how much work went into each uh, particular block, and then like Bitcoin, the rule is we pick the heaviest chain, uh, meaning the chain with most difficulty. Um, you know, this is likely the past most user what users were actually used to interact with Bitcoin because uh, you know who knows like takes like hours, you know, it's just pretty pretty fast now. There's been a bunch of optimizations recently, but you know, it takes a very long time for for, for uh who knows to sync to the network and you can't really run one on your mobile phone, even though question? Yeah, can you just try to sync this one? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, so this is likely, you know, what you'd be writing on your phone because, uh, you know, it's it's much more lightweight, can do with not much, not much RAM and such, uh, and you know, they have different security model than regular phone nodes, meaning that they kind of can't verify everything, so they're a little more trusting, meaning, you know, they're trusted that the miners have it basically inflated all the coins because they can't verify the, the UTXO set or the, you know, the, the input value amounts, and then also they can't really do script execution because if they don't have the UTXO set, then they can't actually verify that everything has been um, you know, uh, spent accordingly, so therefore they basically just have this block, and they know that it's uh, you know, uh, basically been time tapped in this chain, but they're not really concerned about validity of that block within the chain itself, and uh, you know, there are various models for kind of like querying the chain, and that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. Right? So we can validate the entire chain, or at least you know, to a degree, the, that the chain uh, has sufficient work. And so now, how do we actually interact with the chain in order to build useful network services on top of Bitcoin? Um, so now, let's go into kind of like the current state of light clients. So the light client that you probably all know, and probably have on your phone, or, um, you know, or your phone node has some connections to them right now, is BIP37. Um, so BIP37 is kind of like the most widely implemented light client model. Uh, I think the original BIP was in like 2012, so that's like pretty ancient in terms of like, uh, you know, cryptocurrency time, because like one year is like, a bunch of things happen in one year, you know, these days. Um, and it's basically implemented in Bitcoin J, uh, the Red Wallet libraries, um, and then also Bitcoin. And I think basically those are all the current implementations of it. Um, I think Bitcoin J isn't really as maintained anymore, or maybe it's kind of like in maintenance mode while Red Wallet, you know, they have, they're on iOS and Android now, and there's also Bitcoin, um, in which can like run like a light on your browser if you want to, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is basically used most of the decentralized mobile wallets. You know, some of the wallets they maybe connect to a server and they do that for, or they maybe they uh, connect out for like fees or to, to do rescans or other things like that. And the general model of Bitcoin 37 is basically uh, blue filtering, but performed on the server side, right? And uh, you know, the original thing was that like we have this blue filtering thing. There's like a false positive ratio, so the light clients themselves able to kind of like you know regulate that accordingly and to basically not tell all the blue nodes you know what all their addresses are. 
Uh, well, as we'll see in practice, that doesn't really work very well, but you know, that was like the initial uh, intention for creating this type of mode. So uh, dual filters have this, this following execution model. It's kind of like client server, essentially. So what the client does, the client crafts a blue filter that contains all, all of its addresses and like the relevant item that it actually wants to be notified on the chain. And the client then does like a load filter message and then send that message to the full node, right? So now basically per connection, um, you know, the full node is maintaining this filter in memory for the particular like client, right? So then what the uh, light client does now whenever it wants to actually like get relevant data for a block, it requests a filter block, right? And the filter block is like a regular block, but before actually sending any of the contents to the light client, the full node then queries the blue filter, you know, uh, on the server side, if I'm, I'm from the client, and then we'll send anything that matches within the blue filter itself, right? But because blue filters are probabilistic data structures, you may have false positive, right? Meaning something that matches the filter, but which actually the client didn't, didn't request initially. Um, and this can be problematic because every time a, um, a spent output matches, then the full node has to basically modify the filter to add that new entry, right? So this basically means the um, you know filter gets bigger and bigger, and basically the false positive rate can start to um, go up, and then clients basically need to try to regulate this, right? They start to verify, okay, I'm getting a bunch of data that isn't actually mine, so therefore I need to now reload my filter. And um, you know, clients basically are supposed to, to dynamically regulate this false positive rate. If it's too low, then basically you send the entire block and it's just kind of like all of the air. And then uh, if it's too high, then you basically have pretty large filters and that's consuming, I guess, the full node bandwidth, but then also your bandwidth whenever you're loading these uh, filters. And you know, if you're doing initial block download, you basically would need to be doing this method I mean, several times, uh, well, I guess every few blocks or so. Um, so you know, that's the current state, essentially. And this is what's been around for a while. And uh, this is what we're going to talk about including. So uh, what are some of the shortcomings of 37, right? So uh, it's, it's been working for a while, and I think it was good initially to kind of like develop the ecosystem and let people run Bitcoin on their phones, because that's kind of like a really big um, you know, aspect that like, you know, anytime you're some, introducing someone to Bitcoin, you're likely like, hey, you know, download this application, they send you the Bitcoin, and then like, oh, that's really cool, it's like magic internet money. Um, so, you know, it was good that it was around. But it has some drawbacks, right? Um, so, you know, managing this false positive rate in, in practice is actually pretty difficult. And uh, some research has shown that like, no one has really done it well. And there are basically some you know, pretty easy attacks that full nodes can run, that they can like, you know, collect multiple filters from, um, uh, from the light clients, they can basically intersect these filters, basically by doing like a bit by his hand, and they can start to do the intersection attacks against them. And um, another thing is that full nodes can actually lie by omission, meaning that even though something actually masks the filter, they basically just don't tend to the light client, right? And if you don't connect to one node, which you shouldn't be, um, then it's kind of hard to detect this. You really can't detect it. And um, you know, this may be benign, okay, like you know, my money didn't come in two days, but if your application is you know, dependent on kind of like um, quickly um, reacting to on-chain events, maybe there's some like smart contract app um, application where you have like you know, T days to do some action, and if basically you don't see the action on chain, then you, know, you could have uh, some bad things happen. And uh, you know, lastly, they're basically pretty resource intensive, right? So you know, all that work that I had on uh, this other slide, that's all active work essentially, and that's done per client, right? And uh, this can be you know, pretty detrimental because if a full node server is servicing like you know, 10 of like clients essentially, it's basically doing active work for every single like client, right? And there are also some weird some vectors where basically the, you know, a like client can maliciously create a filter which basically matches everything, right? Which means that um, you know, the, the full node that needs to read every single block, everything is matching, they're updating the filter in real time, and this basically causes them to read every single block in the entire chain and then send that to the like client, do all the blue filtering, and that can basically just kind of like make the full node halt essentially. And you know, this has come up in the past before, and um, so if you get, we can get, we can get rid of this. And also, you know, this hasn't really received a serious update since 2012, like, which like I was saying, is like super ancient and different type, right? So uh, that brings us to Boom Filter Digest. So uh, this was initially brainstorm of Bitcoin Wizards, probably like in like 2014. Actually, like before this, like I had searched on like the logs that I have, and I found the link to it. And someone basically came to town like, hey, what if the full node sent the client the filter? And everyone was like, Oh, that's actually a pretty good idea. Why didn't we think of this before? And people were kind of like talking about different ways they can do it, and like you know the trade-off and so on. And uh, basically, then I guess maybe I think it was 2015, 2016. Someone posted the mailing list under like a Nick uh, PFD, a Proton Mail, and they were basically kind of like had a more um, you know flesh out proposal. And then uh, at that point, we're like, okay, this is a pretty good idea. So the general idea is basically reverse dependency, right? With um, Bit 37, there was server-side filtering, but instead we're now going to do client-side filtering. So basically the client requests a filter for a particular block and the full node sends that filter, right? So at this point the client now has the filter locally and can do whatever it wants with it. 
It can basically just store it for later. Maybe there's an application which, where it needs to store for chain data, or it can basically then, if it's a wallet, it's going to you know query against its addresses or its possible help points or anything that it's watching. And then if uh, it gets a match, then this might be relevant, right? Anyway, it might be in the block. And the cool part about this is that now the client can basically fetch the block from anywhere, right? So it basically knows it uses the fullness basically as like a you know uh, a query like a to be able to serve a very compact index. Once it has that index locally, you can then use that for all time, right? And uh, you know, maybe it's doing initial rescan, it's, it's using this, but then you can also use that for um, other future applications or anything else. And uh, you know, there's, there are a few improvements on this. So one is that the full node basically does the work once, right? You can imagine uh, it indexes the chain and has all that, all that locally, and then it's done. And then whenever it needs to serve its live client, it basically serves out this filter and that's it. So this is a big win because now it's basically all passive, and you know, all the work that the full node did cannot be amortized over many of the clients. Uh, the other cool part is that, like, um, with the 37, the phone would actually send the light client, you know, individual transactions, right? So basically, those transactions were possibly, you know, the, the uh, light client's money, or it's sending money, and that basically, you know, allowed very, very easy transaction level intersection attacks. But now this is gone because we fetched the entire block, and uh, the, the light client may not necessarily fetch the block from the same node that it got the filter from, right? Like I was saying, it can be fetched from anywhere. And the other cool part about this is now, now like client can actually now verify the authenticity of the data they're given, because given a block, you can deterministically reconstruct a filter, right? So you can see if a node's actually trying to lie to you, and if you connect to many nodes, you can kind of like, um, you know, verify the integrity of what they give you, and then you'll ban the nodes that are like giving you uh, incorrect data. So uh, so we, we took this kind of around with a little bit, and the original motivation was kind of, um, we wanted a new, like a light client mode that was a little more compatible with Lightning itself, because like I was saying, we're one of those like smart contracting applications where we kind of need to, um, you know, act on on-chain events within a certain time period. So the old, old model wasn't very um, usable in our context, so we decided to basically uh, take the BFD, but a little bit modify it slightly. So uh, rather than using blue filters, we use something called Go and Rice coded sets, and I'll go, in this, go into this a little bit later. And the reason we're using it is that they're more compact than um, regular blue filters. Um, you know, with blue filters, you can update them in real time. With these, you can't, but we don't really care because we basically can track them once for a block, and then we can serve them off to clients uh, uh, after that, afterwards. Uh, the other thing uh, is that the original proposal kind of was uh, was meant to be committed eventually, but uh, our proposal, there's no commitment. It's kind of just, you know, purely P2P, and this is good because we can at least test out the idea first, see if it works, because we don't want it to basically just jump straight to consensus commitment, because then that's like a Bitcoin for all time, unless there's some like, crazy hard works out in the future. And then we also introduced something called a header chain, uh, basically because we're not actually having a commitment, and this header chain is meant to allow clients to basically verify the information that they received. Uh, so we have a big proposal, uh, if you guys want to comment on it, uh, you know, the mailing list, it's by me, and then one of our other engineers, Alex, who um, uses not an SF, unfortunately, and then we also have reference demonstration, uh, which is called Neutrino, and we have, I have four conversion of BTCD, where I've implemented the necessary PDP, PDP extensions, also indexing, and then there is the set itself, and it's also integrated to LND, and I'll go into that a little bit there. All right, so here we start. So now we're actually gonna like go into the details of it. Uh, I won't try to like read everything on the slide, but uh, you know they'll be online to go through later. And there's a bit that goes into it in more detail, and there's code as well if you want to actually like read into that. So uh, at a high level, what we were doing with uh, Go and Rice Coded Sets is we're basically making a probabilistic data structure using a data compression code, right? So initially, we have this set, essentially, and it's a lossy set, meaning that it has some false positive rate, meaning that even though it says something is actually in the set, it may not be in the set. Um, then the, we, um, we use this uh, encoding basically because it lets us compress the, the set itself. And by compressing the set, we, we have space savings, and um, they actually may be like, things like 40% more space efficient than regular blue filter, right? So go and uh, rise code and set, they're basically this like lossless compression code. We actually use it in a different format, but um, typically used in like audio and video compressions. So where you know you have like some picture and it has redundancy, and you basically want to compress it down, there's some video, and you know, similar things to compress that down. Um, so the way it works, uh, it's pretty simple. So you basically have like some integer end, right? And you have your divisor, and you're basically trying to kind of like encode multiples of this divisor itself, right? So if like our divisor is two, and then we have 16, then basically, okay, you know, there's basically eight twos in that, right? So uh, in, in order to encode a single integer n, you have two components, q and r. q is the quotient, and r is the remainder. So you know, to get, to get the quotient, you divide by, by m, and to get the remainder, you do, uh, you know, mod m. And then you have these two um, fields. And then so uh, they're encoded a little bit differently. Q is encoded using unary, and then R is encoded using binary, and it will always be uh, encoded in our specific subset using k bits, right? Where k, uh, this is like the special part that lets us do the rice portion of it, k is always some power of two. 
So basically, the way we do this is you have, you know, you have some integer, and you, it's kind of like run length encoding, where run length encoding is saying, like, you know, rather than like telling you there's like five, 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 I say there are five fives, right? And we do the same thing using this format, and it turns out that because of the distribution of our data, this is um, pretty, very, pretty uh, space efficient. Um, so that's how we actually do the codes themselves, right? So then what we do is we take kind of like this um, you know, false positive set, and we use the goal, the goal of code to actually compress them now. But first, I'll talk about just the initial construction. Um, so first we start with a certain false positive rate, you know, at P, you can say maybe that's like 1 over 2 to the 20, or 1 over a million, or 1 over a thousand, and then you basically have a parameter P, which is 1 over the false positive rate, right? So if our false positive rate is 1 over 2 to the 20, now we basically have 2 to the 20. The other parameter inputted is basically N, which is the number of items in the set, and then you have F, which is N times P, right? So N times P is basically this kind of like restricted, um, you know, set or field that we'll be hashing our items into, and this is kind of where the false positive component comes in because you can look at it, there's, there's basically like P buckets of size N, and then one of those can go into the particular bucket, and then the probability that both of them collide is the false positive rate. Um, so uh, the initial, there's basically two um, steps in actually constructing the set. The first one is construction, the second one is compression, right? So we first take all of our items, and then we use zip hash, which is this like pseudo random function. It's used like a bunch of places. It's like it's like like a module in like Linux kernel now. It's used in like Bitcoin 52 use it in like Python for hash tables, basically used all over the place, it's pretty good. Um, so what we do is we take the uh, items, uh, and then we hash that using zip hash, and then we basically mod that into our field itself, and we do that for every single item, and then afterwards we have this, you know, this uh, set of basically hash values, right? Then we take those hash values and we sort them. So now we sort them in basically ascending order, so it's like one, two, three, four, five, and so on, and that's basically the first part of the set. That can be done pretty quickly, and you know, zip hash is super simple, it can be optimized uh, pretty well. So then uh, after that point, we basically now have a set of items, right, and itself. So instead, we now use Golden Rise to compress the set. So, uh, you know, in the prior set, we basically had them in sort of order, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the difference between every element in the set, and that's going to be some, you know, smaller number, right? Um, and, you know, that's basically the, uh, due to the uh, smaller um, set that we're, that we're hashing into. And, uh, you know, there's like proof in the paper and everything, but the difference of all of these items, because they're uniformly distributed, will represent, will, um, you know, be similar to the geometric distribution, being that Golden Rice is a very good uh, use case for this, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna encode the deltas between every single element, right? So it's kind of like a fold, where we take two elements, we encode the delta of that, and now this, this is like this running remainder, and then we take that element and the next one and encode the delta between that itself. So we're basically encoding all these deltas, and at the very end we have this very, very compressed set of the uh, actual elements, and there's like some pseudocode there, which is you know super important. But you know you're going to go over all the items. You first calculate the remainder using you know that prior element, and quite, uh, then also calculate the quotient using that prior element, and then write the quotient in unary, and write the remainder in binary, and then you have a new accumulator which is that last value, and then you you know put out that set itself. And um, you know, this is pretty small. Um, you know we have some stats that we published uh, along with the. Um, uh, the initial bit proposal, and like for like really big blocks, I mean, well, not really big, but like in full block age, essentially, uh, it's, it's around like, I think the average in the last year or so was like 20 kilobytes per filter, and then historically it's like six kilobytes or so, because most of these blocks were empty in the past. So now we basically have this compressed set, and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, lossy, and that's where we would get this basically this cross positive aspect permit, and now we can go into query. So, you know, unlike blue filters, these can't be queried natively in a regular format, and they also can't be uh, modified, right? So you have the set that's compressed, and at that point, you can basically serve it to anyone else. But in order for you to actually query the set, you need to decompress it. So we basically do the reverse of what we did before. So we're walking through the set, you know, we get the current um, value, we then add it to the accumulator, and now we have an item. We can then query against this item and see if it matches. If not, we go to the next step, we get the next uh, accumulator, we add it, and we keep on going. And uh, this basically lets you query the set incrementally without actually decompressing the entire thing. You could you could decompress the entire thing, but maybe if they're larger, you don't necessarily want to do that. This is kind of uh, you know more space efficient to let you do that in memory. And you can either query you know, like a regular item, basically you have one item, you're basically walking down the set, or you can have you know two sets of items that you want to basically see if it's in the golem set. And what you do is you know you hash those items using that uh, you know f value from before and then zip hash. And you can basically then walk down each item and then you know basically like you know, using like a fast and slow pointer and then see if, that, if anything actually matches. And if any element matches, then you basically say okay, this is a match. We can fetch the entire thing if we actually need to. Um, so now filter construction, right? So we basically have this really cool, uh, you know, compact set. It's probabilistic. It's pretty small. And uh, now basically, what do we put in the set, right? 
So in our proposal, we basically had two filter types. The first one um, is kind of just for regular wallets, basically what a wallet would need during rescan or any other imports. And the second one is kind of you know more extended, perhaps fancier stuff. Maybe we'll take out some of them, but you know we can always remove things, and that's that's okay. Um, so the first set basically includes all of the inputs in a transaction. So basically, you know, which outputs are being spent. We encode the full output, meaning to transaction ID and, uh, and output. And then also includes all the push data in the output scripts themselves. Um, we, I guess we ended up doing push data because we thought that, that was a little more general, that like we could have just done the entire script assuming we have certain script templates, but maybe bare multi-state comes back and is like really popular for some reason in the future. We can, <laughs> we can use this to index it actually. Uh, so then the extended sets are kind of um, for people that are doing kind of more, more passive scanning of the chain or possibly trying to um, you know, be notified of some event in an application that they need to act upon. So the extended um, filter contains transaction IDs. So you can use this to say, you know, is this TX ID in this block? Or maybe is it in the block? Or, you know, has transaction ID been, been confirmed in the block? But then we also uh, encode the witness items, which is basically, you know, the SegWit version of uh, signature scripts. And we also encode the signature script themselves. And that can be useful if you're doing some like, smart contract item, or you know you have something where someone reveals a pre-image, and you want to know if that pre-image was revealed in a particular block. You can use this to check against the filters and then see if the pre-image was included or not. And um, you know we use both these filters in our quotation in Neutrino and, and also in Lightning, as I'll go into later. Um, so like I was saying, there's another new component, which is basically the compact filter header chain, right? So because there's no consensus commitment, the client doesn't really know if these are valid or not, right? If there was a commitment, basically the client would ask for the filter, you know, ask for the Coinbase, um, you know, then ask for a merkle root path with the Coinbase, and then uh, I guess it would be like an opt return, they could verify that it hashes the value of the merkle return, and then actually hashes to, you know, the merkle tree, tree or merkle root. But we don't have a commitment, so we can't do that, right? So what we did instead, we basically provided a way for the client to be able to verify the identity and then reject and down filters. So what it is, is you have every single filter for every single block. You basically create like a, another blockchain, right? You create another hash chain of every single one of those elements. And what this allows us to do is that like, when the client is initially syncing, syncing, it gets all the block headers and then also gets all the filter headers themselves. So then once it has this, all the nodes are basically committed to some you know, prior history in the past. And whenever it fetches a filter, it can then you know, um, reconstruct the, using the prior filter header and the current, and the current um, filter that it fetched, it can then reconstruct that filter hash, and if it matches, then the full node basically was giving it you know, true data. The other thing, this is kind of like a space savings from when it's taken from tip, because otherwise it would basically have to fetch the filter from every single pair, and that's basically, you know, you know, uh, the bandwidth of one filter at a time to the amount of a number of peers connected to. But instead, now it basically fetch the new filter header from all the peers, see if those match up. If those match is good, then it basically fetch the header. If they don't match up, then it fetches, you know, the headers, the filters themselves, can reconstruct the filter to make sure to see which one is actually coming, sorry, fetch the block itself, they can reconstruct the block to see which filter is actually valid, and then from there can ban any, you know, peers that were giving it um, fake data, essentially. Um, but yeah, so that, and uh, basically the way it works is kind of like a recurrence, where um, there's an edge case where there could be an empty block, basically due to the fact that we don't index the, uh, the inputs of the Corbin transaction, and also maybe someone basically just threw away coins in the past, because we ran tests on test that someone basically just wasn't taking the Coinbase output. So we had, we had to add a special case for, um, for empty blocks, in the case of an, empty, of an empty filter, then it's basically just a zero hash and you can continue going. Um, so yeah, so now we're getting to kind of some of the peer extensions, right? So because this is kind of like a new, uh, you know, servicing mode in Bitcoin, the light client needs to be able to preferentially find different peers that um, can actually service it, right? So first thing we do is we add a service bit, and this is cool because then when the client connects or whenever it gets an error message, it can see if the peer actually supports it or not. And also the DNS seeding lets you actually, um, has like a subdomain, and using that subdomain you can query the DNS seeds for peers would actually have these service bits. So it also saves some time from connecting to peers. You can say, okay, DNS seed, only give me peers that, that actually uh, you know, have this new uh, method. Then we also bump protocol version. I think it's 17. There's like send headers and feed filter before that, but uh, that's the new protocol version. And then in addition to that, we also add a few new uh, PDP message types, right? So the first type um, is basically, uh, because there are multiple filter types, and in the future, it's feasible that they could be extended, we can basically have new things in the filters, or we could even have uh, you know, new encoding types if we figure out one's more efficient for a particular use case, just in general. Um, so then, uh, this allows the client to basically query the phone up to see which filters it supports. So usually it does like, you know, get CF types, and then gets the types and says, okay, it supports these end filters, and that's the end that I want. And then there are two other pairs of messages, get CF headers and CF headers. These work basically identical to the way get headers works. Um, you know, basically you have like a block locator and you can like touch back, and then you have CF headers that actually gives you the, um, 
the compact headers themselves, and you know, clients will use these doing initial block download to actually fetch which filters are relevant to them. And then finally, we have get CF filter and CF filter, and these are basically let you get a filter by a particular block cache, right? And the cool thing is that this can be done fully, like very lazily, right? The client can sync the entire um, you know, chain of the header chain, and then from there, from TIFF can actually start to fetch um, uh, blocks, I mean, sorry, fetch filters for different blocks, or it can even start at the end and then go backwards, you know, which is basically the flip of the chain thing, will let you come up to speed very, very quickly. So, you know, all this stuff is super useful because, um, you know, maybe if y'all know, like, if you run, like, Bitcoin core nodes or any other node, like, rescanning takes forever, right? If you're going to rescan, it's going to take hours, you're going to have to read every single block. But what you can do now is, if you have a, like an RPC for these filters, the client or the person that wants to rescan from the full node can fetch these filters and then see if maybe it's in the block and then basically do a manual rescan themselves. And this is faster because the full node no longer needs to read every single block from disk and match all the developing addresses. It can basically just serve you these filters over the RPC, which would be very efficient. Another cool thing this enables is basically that uh, light clients can now, decentralized light clients can now basically do, you know, very um, uh, succinct, basically, rescans and key imports, right? So now, since they have all the filters on disk, or maybe they will, once they have a key they need to import, they can then see and then, um, you know, query to see which blocks they may need to fetch. The other cool thing about this is currently, if you're ever, like, importing, um, you know, like an HTC in a wallet, it typically has to, has to hit, like, a, um, uh, a centralized server to basically look at the like, center public key and see how far ahead, you know, how many addresses they've been generated, right? That's kind of a dependency we'd like to eliminate. This lets you eliminate the dependency because if you have all the filters on disk, you can again just query them locally. Uh, and this is also cool because it lets you do, uh, you know, high Bitcoin applications because it's kind of a more natural uh, you know, application model that you have the set, I query the set, maybe I, I get the block, rather than like, I have a filter, I send the filter, I need to be in regular cost positive, I get the replica block, I get the transaction, you know, that's kind of a lot more complicated. Um, so now to Neutrino. But it lets you make a wallet on top of it, it lets you make like a lightning node, or it lets you make any, make any other thing on top of it. Um, so we also put this out because we felt like, you know, there was kind of like a lack in like well-maintained libraries for light clients in the, uh, in the space, and it's also cool because, like I was saying, it provides a lot of utility with 37 itself. And uh, one other thing we were making, so our, you know, our primary motivating factor was basically to make a uh, lightweight lightning node because uh, you know, we work on lightning, and specification, also some code. And uh, like we were saying, the application model is very cool because now we can directly query these filters and respond to on-chain events. We don't need to worry about clients possibly you know, omitting, or full nodes possibly omitting data, which could cause us to you know, possibly lose money, so on like broadcast remote state and stuff like that. And uh, this is also a necessary uh, piece for us to eventually you know, have a mobile clients for Lightning. So now you can soon, you know, in the near future, you'll be able to have lightning nodes on your phone, and that's kind of like, we'd be like a killer aspect of it, because you're not gonna be carrying around your laptop to make transactions and things like that, so that's pretty helpful. Uh, there's still a good bit to be done. In the future, we're gonna start to use, to use send headers, which basically lets you cut down the amount of time it takes you for you to save the next block, because right now, you know, it's like the full attend you an inv, and then you say, okay, maybe that's useful, then you do get data, then you have a block. But with send headers, you, it just basically sends you headers directly. Because we're a light client, all we care about is headers. So now, as soon as we get the headers, we can get the uh, filter headers, and then from that, we can see if we need to get the filter or not. Um, the other cool thing is because we actually consume entire blocks, we can do much, much uh, consensus validation, right? Well, I mean, you know, in the past, uh, Big 37 clients could have done more, but like the way they implemented, they basically don't verify anything, which is pretty bad, but we'll be able to verify, you know, softworks, maybe, I mean, well, most softworks, you know, we can verify Big 9, maybe some hardworks as well. We can also verify things like the block size, sync off limits, um, uh, transaction size, and things like that. And another cool thing is that because you're able to fetch the block from anywhere once you actually match the filter, we can add new pluggable backends into that, right? And that could be some crazy thing like some like, you know, computational pri private information retrieval, or it could be fetching from several peers or some like onion routing network, or like through some CDN or through some server or something like that. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of like how you actually get the block once you realize that you need, or that it may be relevant. Uh, so Lightning and Neutrino. So Neutrino is now, you know, as I'm speaking, it's integrated into backend for LND meaning you can now run LND on uh, Bitcoin's testnet. We don't have Lightning support for it yet because it adds that whole like power change and like different, different like difficulty readjustment things like that. But it's currently fully into LND and it wasn't, you know, it was pretty uh, easy to do so because LND's backends are all fully abstracted, right? So, you know, the amount of work we did to add uh, Neutrino, you can add Bitcoin Core or like Insight or any other backend into it. But right now we have uh, LND fully integrated with Neutrino. And basically, if you want to like download right now, you can basically run the, this command for those particular arguments. Neutrino is active and you add a peer. And then from there, the connection network starts syncing the nodes. I mean, start syncing all the headers and you can actually start to make channels. And this is very cool because now, like, I've been running on my laptop and I only have Neutrino. I don't have a full node, but I need to, you know, connect to someone else's full node. So, like, you need another full node somewhere, but it's indirect, so it's a little different. 
Uh, but this is cool because now this means we can run uh, you know, LND and Lightning on phones, on like Raspberry Pis, like embedded devices, and smaller resource constrained devices. Um, it's getting really like we need to do a bit of optimization in terms of like initial block download because like the database we use kind of just like falls over because like especially on testnet, you know, testnet has 1.1 million blocks and you're basically like shoving a bunch of data in there very quickly. So we're going to like switch to another one and make it a little bit faster. Uh, which is pretty cool because uh, we also designed Lightning Protocol, like Lightning RMC. There's like a link that you click later uh, with full with light clients in mind, right? So the way it's designed, light clients can ver can verify all the channel proofs. So like within the network, we don't just say here's a channel. We say here's a channel and then here's proof that it's valid. And the light client can still verify that because we encode basically you know the block number, the transaction index, and the output index. So using that information, you know it can go like its header file, fetch the block, and then also fetch the transaction and verify that it's been unspent. And we also use this basically to you know, respond to on-chain events, like people's channels being closed, which means we can delete an ad from the, um, from the graph. And then also anytime one of our channels gets closed, either you know, by us unilaterally, or possibly you know, the, the case, which is like the dangerous one, which is one someone tries to breach the contract, and we can cash them and take all their money, which is cool. But uh, yeah, so there's some optimization to be done, but it's usable today, so you can download it and start measuring off lightning. And uh, you know, it's much faster, like before test would take maybe like a few hours, this can be done in like 20 minutes or so, but we're trying to make it faster. Um, but yeah, uh, so there yeah there are a few future directions that we want to head into. Or I mean, this, these, some of these require modifications to Bitcoin, some don't. So one thing, if we had UTXO set commitment, you know, it would be much more efficient. Because right now, in order to verify that a channel isn't yet closed, we basically need to get the block, um, you know, find where it is uh, in the block itself, and then scan forward in the chain to see if it's ever been spent. You know, the scanning for it isn't that bad because we don't actually, we don't have to download all the blocks. We can instead, you know, check all the filters in that. But that can still be, um, you know, if we don't have the filters on disk or if it's a very very old channel, that can be pretty resource intensive. Another, uh, you know, future PDP extension we can get is Merkle get block TXN, which I just made up uh, before before I was writing the slides. And it's basically like get block TXN, which is using compact block, which basically lets you get a um, transaction by index. We want to get that in by index, but then also get a Merkle proof, right? So this is kind of like BIP37, but it's a little bit uh, you know, better because we're just getting a particular transaction. And we don't really care if they know that we're getting a transaction because this is just like, you know, to verify the graph because the graph is essentially an authenticated data structure. And we could say also in a post hornet world, and uh, for those not familiar, basically Lightning uses underwriting, basically uh, you know, to route the payments themselves so people don't know who the destination is or where they are on the route. Uh, we use something called Sphinx, and there's something that's a little bit better called Hornet. Hornet uses Sphinx, but the cool part about Hornet is that you actually form like a circuit, right? And when you actually form the circuit to um, send a message to the to the responder, you also give them basically the backwards route, right? And this backwards route is fully encrypted. So this means that it can send information back to you, but not actually know the source. So if I'm fetching these filters from the regular network, I can then use Hornet, maybe on Lightning, to then query some random node in the network and ask them for the block, but they don't know who I am. You know, with some caveats about like um, uh, graph, graph uh, diversity and things like that. But it's pretty cool because then we can actually, you know, put more services on top of the network itself, make it more useful, and also make things easier for light clients, and also provides a more private way to actually fetch blocks. And then maybe in the future, we can start to serve headers directly on the network itself. Because like, uh, you know, we have like 65K message size, but still, uh, you know, you can just chop them up and get people synced up pretty, pretty quickly. Um, yeah, so there's source code uh, on Lightning Labs slash Neutrino, and then that's Twitter we yeah. have. Um, and yeah, thanks. Any questions, anyone? Did uh, reference potentially using uh, private information retrieval? Yeah. So your uh, sets when they're returned, they're actually giving an ordering of the things in it. So it would seem very natural that instead of downloading the entire block, if you need something, you use private information retrieval, just sending a bit field of what things to XOR together to a set of peers where you make it so the XOR of all those is the one thing that you want. And that could make it so that your communications are really super itty bitty. Oh, yeah, it breaks like regular techniques, which are like super bandwidth intensive. Yeah, yeah no, that's, yeah, that's something I haven't thought about. Yeah, we should follow up on that. That's, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I have a question. Hi. Uh, I'm sitting here. Hey. Um, <laughs> I actually have two questions. Yeah. One is um, you talk about a basic uh, filter and an extended filter. Mm -hmm. Do you need the extended filter functionality for um, the Lightning? 
protocol uh, implementation you're building now? Um, so as as it is now, the only thing we actually need is the TXID. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just we need that currently to be able to basically say if our transactions are being confirmed. But like you know, we like once we talk about this in IRC, we realize maybe we can compress it down. If we know the TXID, we probably know like the script itself, and then you can actually press that down a little bit. We don't really yet have direct users for the witness or the uh, six script data, but we just kind of put that in because maybe it could be useful. But because we do have the uh, you know, the filter types, that can be introduced later possibly. So we could skim that down a little bit. Okay. Um, the other question I had um, uh, is what are the value? What, how do you determine the optimal value of M? To use in your Bloom Rice. Gotcha. Yeah. So initially, we just kind of like chose a parameter and then like did everything and then did all the work and realized maybe we should actually like try to justify that with some data. So uh, the current <laughs> yeah, that's good idea, right? um, the, the the current value we have, we've chosen is basically we try to um, we use basically like a model which is kind of like using like uh, the CDF and the geometric distribution and also the actual data on the chain. And what we try to do is we try to minimize the data given like you know a client with like 100 addresses or 200 addresses. Try to minimize the data, the expected um, bandwidth from downloading the filters and also the false positive rates themselves. Um, so that's how we arrive at the current value of p equals 20. I think we use like 50 queries for the client, um, but we also have like a calculator that lets you kind of adjust some of the values. And this is one of the spots where we kind of need further tuning. And uh, when, we, when we push the mailing list, there's someone named Carl who actually done like pretty extensive research on this in the past. And so I think we're going to like follow up with him and then see if we can kind of like you know, make this more optimal. And uh, the reason for this is because it's like a global value, we want to like actually have a good, you know, good value rather than having something that like really is poor down the line or is a lot of lines. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? <laughs> Nobody has a question. Just a general lightning one. Um, yeah. Can you give us an update on lightning on Litecoin? Uh, lightning on Litecoin. Uh, it's like it was kind of like uh, pushed aside to finish up all the steps essentially. But like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, so the steps for that is basically you know, there's an issue in Neutrino basically to make the POW and also the difficulty just unpluggable because with that rate, then we basically just add new command line parameter and you can use Neutrino on Bitcoin or Neutrino on Litecoin. Uh, you know, once we do that, then we can basically uh, you know also enable the mode um, in Bitcoin. I mean, sorry, for Litecoin and LND. Right now, it's there, but if you try to do it with Litecoin, it basically gives you like an error that because not supported currently. Um, but uh, but then beyond that, uh, we're basically starting. We're very very close to having like you know cross implementation, cross implementation compatibility, compatibility, and kind of like we've kind of like frozen most most of the aspect of the specification. So we're basically, all right, we're not going to change anything for now. We have what, what we know we want on the next version. But at least we can start to converge towards this. And uh, probably by the end of the month it, month month ish here, uh, you know, we'll have a new release of LND, which basically should be fully. Um, uh, specification compatible, and then from there on, it's kind of like you know, do compatibility testing, robustness, um, you know, making sure uh, it's fault tolerant, and so on. Yeah, and then there's some other stuff they're working on with Litecoin uh, that'd be cool later. <laughs> <Great day. laughs> yeah. No more questions? Any then? Yeah. Uh, awesome presentation. Yo, you cut your hair. I know, it's all gone. <laughs> and then I misplaced my start. Uh, okay. But anyway, uh, it was awesome, thank you. Um, I was wondering, like, and this might be too general a question, but uh, what do you think is the, the lowest, lowest possible resource device that you could run something like Neutrino and get a wallet working on? Like, obviously you mentioned Raspberry Pis, but like, could you go, could you go lower? Like, what is, what is something, you know, the very, very... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so like you know, at least on testnet, that's kind of like measured because that's kind of like old man Bitcoin. Also, it has a million blocks. Uh, I think you know all the header state is like 150 megs essentially, with all the you know Bitcoin headers and all, and all the uh, filter headers itself. So you 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 at least need that much um, in terms of um, you know flash or whatever you're using on the device. Uh, LND itself, um, you know, if we like tune things down to a good bit, can run on. Well, I mean, you know, the good runtime time actually uh, blows up a little bit, but it runs on like. Can get down to like 50 megs or so um, in terms of like what it needs actively when you have a few channels, and you can go beyond that if you have more channels and like you're doing much routing and things like that. Um, so I'm not quite sure, but those are like some rough specs in terms of like memory usage and also um, uh, you know space usage that actually moves itself. I think it would be plausible to do something on like risk risk V, or is that like way in the future? 
Uh, maybe. I'm not sure if Go has cross compilation support for that. If it does, we could try it and <laughs> see if it works or not. But yeah, I mean, so that'd be cool. And also to see, you know, once we actually do some more optimization to make LND, you know, much more slimmer, to see what kind of devices we get into. And, you know, it'd be cool if you're running on, like, your router and maybe you're doing some, like, crazy mesh networking thing. There's, like, micropayments and, like, there's all that other stuff. Um, but that's definitely, like, a cool feature and something that we envision that, you know, this can would be used for in that context. Thanks. Yeah. Questions? Can I assign someone to ask a question? Uh, question? Mike? <laughs> uh, I haven't dug into how how uh, lightning is handling onion routing, but mm -hmm. does it still suffer from like um, you know uh, exit routing signal analysis? Essentially, <laughs> if you if you are a exit node and you notice, okay, I see this profile, usage profile, does it, is it still suffer from that? Or? Uh, I mean, there, there's like a, an analogous issue currently in the way Lightning is uh, now, uh, that you know, they're like payment hashes, and those payment hashes are the same through, throughout the entire route. We know how to randomize them in the future, but that needs a little more fancier stuff, either like some weird grinding stuff for signatures, or if we can have, you know, some more, um, actually, if we have store signatures, we can basically do that. And that point, that lets us randomize the payment hash every single point of the route, right? So currently, if you have two, two nodes that are, you know, on the same route, they can identify that it's the same payment. So in the future, we know how to um, uh, how to do that, and Pulsar knows how to do it. He wrote about it, so you can ask him about the Schnorr stuff a little bit more. Um, beyond that, I guess there's like you know regular traffic analysis stuff. But in the protocol, we do have like a ping message. In that ping message, you tell the responding node how many bytes to respond in a palm, and also the ping can be padded out itself. So you can use that itself to, to pick some traffic and like you know throw your real traffic in there. And uh, you know that's definitely going to be an uphill battle in the future. But at least we have something that like works, you know, uh, you know, the abstract, and then once we actually do the uh, deployment, we'll get into, you know, the nitty-gritty implementation issues, and then, you know, start the whole uh, battle itself. Yeah, so, uh, someone's going to ask a question. Final question from Elizabeth. Um, so swaps, uh, you know, it's not something we're super, I mean, we're not like committing a bunch of time to right now, um, but like at least there's like the scaffolding to do, to do so in LMD. So I was talking about the way like the different backends are all abstracted out. So, you know, you can have like, uh, the way it is right now, you basically just have like a map of like, you know, the chain to the different backends. So then from there, you can basically have an LMD that's running on like two chains or three chains or how many other chains. And, uh, you know, once it's on the chain, it's basically kind of like a border node, right? And can facilitate trades, uh, you know, between the Notion network. Um, so kind of like the way we're you know, thinking about that is that like we don't necessarily want to put all that like pricing and like feed information, put you know the information from the venue directly to the network. Instead, there can be kind of like some higher level signal layer, right? Because once you once you're matched up, you basically do the HLC, boom, and it's done. But then you know the work of actually you know finding the you know the matches for people to trade with, in addition to you know what their rates are, which currencies to support, that can all be lifted onto another network. So I guess maybe layer three, <laughs> and then uh, below that we have Lightning itself, and uh, we can do core control on that. And also, it's cool that like uh, with Lightning, you can actually combine like on and off chain HDLCs. So you could say, you know, if a uh, you know chain you want to trade on doesn't really have like, a you know robust malleability fix, you could at least if that's like one of the final hops or even if it's not a final hop, you could make a regular on chain HDLC. That may slow things down a little bit because it requires a transaction for confirmation. But this is kind of like a more adapter bridge, which lets other chains that aren't compatible um, to do trading. Um, but short answer, uh, it's possible. We don't have to do it. We're not focusing on it yet. We're focusing on basically, you know, making it work well in Bitcoin, and then beyond that, we can actually branch out to other chains. If we want to. Yeah, and there's like, I mean, so likely first maybe Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Litecoin, cross chain coming soon. Yeah. How would level three work? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, level three is basically, you know, it's like matchmaking, it's signaling, and then, um, you know, possibly the way it works now, if, you, you know, you could possibly, uh, you know, so one thing you can do is like matchmaker can make part of the onion ride itself to force itself to be the intermediate node and extract some fees for, you know, that service essentially. So there's, you know, a bunch of cool designs like that on top of that, like utilize a uh, different components of lightning itself to make uh, this higher level stuff actually work. And, you know, there's a bunch of people working on this stuff now, um, you know, across the chains. Uh, you know, people were kind of into this whole decentralized exchange thing because, you know, people were crazy about this token stuff and also maybe it'd be nice to have like, you know, two exchanges that do all the volume in the world. Um, but yeah. But people work on it to be figured out and maybe we'll be doing some stuff in this area in the future. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much.